नमस्कार I welcome you, you all for yet another interesting episode of India Ireland friendship lecture series. Today we have with us an artist who has created her own niche in the world of contemporary art. I welcome Miss Seema Kohli, the owner of Eclectic Creative Repertoire, who has been using a wide range of mediums ranging from painting, murals, experiential installation performances, sculptures, etc. and each medium has been a unique expression of her style past 35 years her works are parables of tales both imagined and real celebrating the simultaneous fragility and tenacity of creation as well as the melody and exuberance of the oneness of being myth and fable apart there are many layered explorations rooted as much in philosophy as they are in the knowledge of our modern times her works has been appreciated in india as well as abroad with having solo exhibitions in brussels melbourne london new york dubai singapore as well as in india in delhi mumbai and bangalore she has exhibited her art on many prestigious platforms to mention a few at art basel in 2009 arco madrid in 2010 shanghai art fair in 2011 Beijing Biennale in 2012, the Venice Biennale in 2014 and 2015, Hong Kong Art Fair in 2015, India Art Fair in 2022. She is the recipient of the Lalit Kala Academy Lifetime Achievement Award for Women in 2008 and the Young Fikki Ladies Organization Women Achievers Award in the same year. She also won the gold medal at the florence biennale in 2009 it is our privilege to have miss seema with us to share her thoughts on the topic journey of surya from martanda to hiranyagarbha immortal cycle of creation and recreation before we invite her to enlighten us with her thoughts on this intense and interesting topic i would request his excellency the ambassador of india to give his introductory remarks to the lecture namaskar dhanyawad ji at the outset i would like to express uh, my warm greetings to all uh, friends who are connected with this program uh, within ireland and also from india uh, it is a great privilege for us uh, indian indian embassy to welcome uh, someone who is uh, uh, so accomplished and so sincere we committed to promotion of indian culture uh, heritage and values and in a broader sense uh, seema ji uh, it's a, it's a wonderful privilege for us to have you on this uh, program uh, as seema ji might have explained to you that the idea behind this initiative uh, india island friendship lecture series uh, is to uh, revive and re uh, energize the spirit of uh, friendship and warmth and goodwill that india and ireland have traditionally enjoyed uh, ireland was one of the countries which really inspired our freedom struggle uh, ireland was one of the countries which inspired our constitution very profoundly because it was uh, full of a very modern forward looking ideas uh, and also in the field of art and culture ireland and india have a lot to learn from and benefit from by sharing Uh, but at the same time we discovered that there are obvious uh, physical constraints in uh, activating a robust and uh, broad based people to people contact because there is no direct flight connection and also the indian community in ireland is not as big as in uk or canada or us or, or some other countries so there is not enough critical mass to sponsor and support physical uh, exchanges so we came up with this idea to have a hybrid mode uh, for promoting cultural exchange and awareness in different areas of interest to both countries whether it's economic development science and technology startups and innovation uh, and also uh, different forms of art and culture uh, so the idea is that we we make positive developments in india and the talents and the creativity that is happening in india different parts of india different sectors of life Uh, to the people in ireland in different counties similarly we are inviting 
uh, Irish friends to share their thoughts on uh, uh, their experiences and make them aware, uh, disseminate as widely as possible among the people of India. So uh, I hope that your very inspiring lecture and your creative journey will not only uh, uh, help people in Ireland get to know about your personal work, but also probably have a broader impact in terms of uh, initiating multiple uh, contacts between India and Ireland. And uh, given your vast international experience, I would very much like to uh, follow up on this interaction. Uh, and probably we can come up with some interesting low cost, but high impact uh, engagements. Uh, uh, and also I must thank you for choosing the theme, uh, which is very special and very dear to me personally, because uh, uh, in, in Sanskrit literature, I see this, the, the concept of Surya has been a very potent central theme in, Ved, in Vedas and Vedic Sahitya. Aditya is one of the names of Param Brahma. Uh, it's not just one physical entity, but it's an infinite uh, manifestation, the, the Param Brahma him, uh, itself. And also Surya is referred to as Pita. Uh, Pita is not just biological uh, father, but also in Sanskrit, it's Yah Patu Palayativa, Sa Pita, someone who does nurturing and also uh, protects uh, his father. And that is why when we pray daily in Vedic prayer, we say Madhu Dev Rastu Nah Pita, uh, like our father in the sky, may everything be harmonious to him and uh, keep shining. Uh, and also, uh, as a Shiva Bhakta, I feel very touched because uh, Shiva is uh, described as Chandrar Kavaishwanar Lochanaya. Uh, uh, he, he, and also in you know, Rig Veda, it says uh, Chakshoha Suryo Ajayaka. Uh, in human body, um, eyes are only parts which have light, they shine on their own. Uh, and the same way, Surya is a body which is self illuminated. Atma Jyoti. So it has multiple implications, multiple ideas synthesized in one. In Itihas Puran, again, Surya is such a powerful central role that Ram Chandra himself was a Surya Vanshi. Uh, uh, and, and also, you know, that uh, when he has to face uh, the mighty uh, army of uh, Ravan, then, Ra then Ram had to do worship of Surya. And there's a very powerful Aditya Hridaya Stotra. Uh, uh, which, uh, so he, he did worship uh, Surya and then uh, because of power he got, he vanquished uh, Ravana. Esh Brahma cha Vishnu cha Shiva Skandha Prajapati Mahendro Dhanadha Kalo Yamaha Somo Hyapam Patihi Aditya Savita Surya Khaga Pusha Gabhastiman Suvan Sadisho Bhadur Hirane Reta Divakara. So it's a, such a fascinating theme for an artist, for a thinker, for a, a, a reformer to contemplate on. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to your version of uh, how you how you have developed this idea. Once again, my very sincere thanks to you, Sima Ji. It's very kind of you to accept our invitation. Although we are not able to offer you anything, uh, you have spared your precious time. Namaskar, uh, Namaskar, Akhilesh It has been such a privilege uh, to know that this kind of lecture series is going on between India and Ireland. And I feel very happy to be a part of this and contribute like whatever as an artist, you know, we interpret our thoughts, whatever is there in our thoughts. And as you have mentioned about Surya, there are so many interpretations and Surya is one concept or one identity which is available to everyone in this universe. Every country, every being is, you know, sort of beneficial or benefited by this uh, 
uh, this concept or this image of Surya, which is there, which is given to us by Prakriti, by nature, which is there for us. So I would talk about uh, the journey of Surya and the two aspects of Surya. Surya is called Hiranyagarb and as one part, the one which is got a golden womb, which is so beautiful that it has got a golden womb. Everything that go, comes out of it is living. It is never dying. It, is, it recycles, it recreates, it is constantly procreating. And that's the feminine aspect of it. Then it is Martand also. Martand it means Amrit, a, a dead egg. That is also Surya. So how, how it is called both the things at the same time, it is the, it is the ninth Aditya. I think I will discuss this once I uh, start with it. So I will start with the process. Can we have the start with the images also along with it? Uh, and I'll just keep on saying next so that we can, uh, you know, keep on moving further with the images also. So I start with the first uh, mantra, uh, which has fascinated me, which uh, almost about, as a child, we always heard it as a part of the home and at home, but later it became a part of my whole entity and I hope it continues to be. So it is, Om Hiranya Garbha Samavartata Grai Bhutasya Jata Patirek Asi Sadadhar Prithvim Dhyamutema Kasmai Devaya Havisha Videma. So in the beginning, there was one in its splendor as the golden womb, manifested as the sole lord of land, skies, water, space, and that beneath, and that deity upheld the earth and the heavens. This is the deity we shall worship with our offerings. This is the direct meaning of this uh, uh, mantra, which is from the Hiranyagarbha Sukta in Yajurved. And uh, this painting that you see is the Pahari painting of golden cosmic egg, uh, which is uh, probably painted in uh, 1740. I have been hearing about the above Hiranyagarbha Sutta since I was a child. However, when my mother departed from this world, I heard it again during a ceremony and something unusual took over me completely. Since then, the golden womb or Hiranyagarbha has been integral part of my art for my existence, for everything that I look around. According to one of the most popular versions of this myth, after the Mahapralaya or the great dissolution of the universe, I'm telling you the stories behind this whole concept of the golden womb or this, uh, you know, when this dissolution of the universe happened, there was absolute darkness everywhere with nothing moving or static. Now, this is a contradiction where there's no movement and it is not even, sta uh, it is static and there is a complete darkness, but there is a complete movement also. There is a dissolution happening everywhere. Admit that a golden egg floated around in the primordial waters until it eventually split and the cosmos, cosmos was created. Heaven emerged from the golden upper half of the earth or Prithvi. From the silver lower half, the Prithvi came, the upper half, heaven or Swarga came. In Vedic philosophy, the golden womb is the source of all creation, the consistent energy which is constantly procreating, creating, recreating and positively recycling everything around us. My own body of artworks has been an embolic reflection of my deep connect with the spirit of Hiranyagarbha, the golden womb, or the Hiranyagarbha Koham. Like, what is Hiranyagarbha series? I created this series called that. It expresses the constant creativity that functions throughout the universe. The lotus stems framing my canvases are indicated 
of the umbilical cord that is the symbol, symbol of progeny, the female protagonist holding close the tree as the golden womb is an extension of fertility that leads to the creation of the cosmos and the world. As my painting showed around with the scriptural mantras, I also do a lot of calligraphy during uh, I paint over my paintings. They also come alive with everyday mundane images of teacups, kettles, and clocks. For me, everything that is existing has life, even if it is just non-existent, non-spiritual uh, you know, entities. Martand, on, on the other hand, is a concept that has recently entered the preview of my artistic imagination. Although I had known it for a long time, I had not researched about it, but Martanda entered my art, my entity, my imagination only by the, the word. It was called Martanda and it was uh, another form of Surya, which was quite strange than what I had seen it as. Etymologically, it means a dead egg. Mrat means dead and under is an egg. Legend says that Martanda was the eighth and the last of the Vedic solar deities called Adityas. Hence, the sun here is the dead egg. But we know of Surya as also the source of all energy, of all life, of all creation. And that's what I was familiar with, but it was a surprise to hear it as a dead end. Can we have the next image? This is a sixth century sculpture of standing Surya. The relation of Martanda and Hiranyagarbha is that of contradiction, a contradiction in the form of affirmation and negation, and a contradiction that passes on to all the entities in the world. We are an entity that embodies this relation and contradiction. The upper half of our body, just like the ninth Aditya and Shiva, is that of Hiranyagarbha. This is the half that makes us see liberation and attain Swarga. The lower half of the body is that of Brahma, which is the space of constant creation, which is where we, all, we, we find that all activities take place. We are constantly procreating because of this contradiction. To me, this gap between creation and recreation is Martanda. If anything, Martanda is a part of Hiranyagar, according to me. When we turn around a path, the path does not end, nor the movement, only a temporary and a gentle slowing down of life occurs. This is liminal between this. This phase, I can say, can be the phase of Martanda, as I understand. This is very fascinating for me. This connectivity and the circularity of death and birth that we find constantly happening around us. Without death, there is no birth. And without birth, there is no death. What begins and what ends? It's a wonder. Even before I consciously painted Haranyagar, I was already addressing this transformative continuity and circularity of birth and death, of earth, of Martanda and Hiranyagarbha. In my works, what occurs is only a change of forms. When we breathe out, it dies inside me, but it again collaborates with the eternal life outside. I'm just talking about the, the basic pranayam, the basic uh, concept of birth, and the basic concept of breath. So when it comes, goes out, well outside to bring back a new inhalation of breath, there is life which is going inside me. So each one of us is an eternal source of Martanda 
and Hiranyagar. We both, anything inside and outside is survival of each other. And each other becomes Martanda and Hiranyagarbha for each other. Martanda is inevitable for Hiranyagar. The Shaiva Sutra refer to the annihilative nature of Martanda in the following way. Surya, Prarambha, Tvahaha. According to this, in this form of the 12 Indriyas and the 12 sons, Martanda, that gets laid in the level of Ahankara, giving the, giving the name of Martanda Kali to this state. The Krama Sutra says, in spite, I will not say the Sanskrit uh, version because uh, I think uh, it's going to take a lot of time and we can go to the English translation. In spite of being united, the section of Bhogya to be enjoyed and the Parasambhad, Rupa Jagadishwara restrains the Martanda, the Pramata, in the form of ahankara in this way, that all that means of enjoyment is the form of patanga, the insects, the chakras, that is the 12 indriyas are ended as the insect filled with extreme enthusiasm and velocity flies towards the burning lamp, giving up its life and ending its self form. Hence, to me, Martandakali, is the ultimate state of liberation or moksha. That is where one cycle ends. And again, that goes into the, uh, the uh, Hiranyagarbha state. And again, the life continues. The liberation happened, the moksha happened, but that is also a part of duration. And it has to come back through the idea of Hiranyagarbha. I would like the next image to come. So I want to tell the universality of this concept of Surya. This is what I saw in Azerbaijan. This is a stone cut representation of sun, uh, sun of 15th century. Then this is a pre-Columbian uh, pendant of uh, sun, which I got from one of my friends, Stella. So uh, the concept of Hiranyagar, the concept of Surya is universal. We may call it different names. We may call it different uh, through seeds, through different identities, or we may give it, uh, give it a different mythological meaning, but it all accumulates into the same uh, probably qualities of constant procreation. Furthermore, the Hiranyagar or Martanda is not to be understood just through an abstract and conceptual lens. The investigation of space of Hiranyagarbha and Martanda lies in the real as well as in the abstract. The philosophy of this space unfolds itself in the everyday ordinary, ordinariness of life through the journey of body and mind. Hiranyagarbha and Martanda is not only a physical, biological space, but also a physiological psychological, ideological, social, or a spiritual space. I just uh, say a few verses that I wrote. Mind, which is just a space, one thought born, one thought dead, like forms, births, relationships, rising like a bubble gum in my mouth and ending right there. Convictions trained by time, swallowing them, vanquishing them, licking them, and erasing them just the same way as life. We think it is the end. Whenever there is a death, whenever there is a changing of the course of energy changes, we think that, well, this is the end, but it is not. It is just another beginning. And I call it birth of color through clay and air. We are all made of mitti, of clay, and of the vayu, or the beyond, which is around us. Even the space helps us being what we are. At first was the birth, the cosmos exploded into fiery fragments. Fierce flames lapped the skies, intense heat melted worlds, formed or forming new ones, creating new universes. Each spinning around 
paths they would be bound to across infinity. Births are painful, powerful. Violence, defiance is essential for any creation. With blood and screams I come, but silently I shall depart. These primordial words radiate intense energy. Millions of years cold, molten lavas, tempered hot winds, conceived oceans, rivers and lake, and still time rolled on and on and on. And then there were more birds. So this concept, this concept of Hiranyagar is so beautiful that you find it that it is never ending. It's just moving on. And the, the space of Martanda is only a space of change, the change of, it's just like changing gears in the car, you know. So that's how I see. And if we go to another level, who births an artist? What is a work of art? Is it solely in the able hands of an artist that gives birth to creation? What goes behind that birth? When does the gestation period of a piece of art begin within the artist? Now I'm trying to talk, talk to you about art, artist, and creation, just the same way as uh, there is this process of Hiranyagar. Is the birth of an artist simultaneous with the birth of a person? Is the artist, and hence, also each one of her artworks, not an amalgamation of married factors that molds her being into continuum, be it sociological, intellectual, emotional, or spiritual. When I contemplate on my own life's journey, I remember some pertinent memories from my childhood. Till the age of five years, I was an extremely reticent child when the matters reached a point my father took me to a psychiatrist. That is also the day when my father brought me brush and colors. And that was the day I found myself. From then onwards, I found my language and almost everything around me became my muse and canvas. At the age of seven or six maybe, the acknowledgement of being an artist dawned upon me Today, my works abound with my theological and spiritual themes from all across. But it is interesting to think of when and how these things, imageries, started becoming a part of my artistic thought. For me, the folk and mythological story imparted to me by my father and grandfather were full of vibrant imageries. Interestingly, I was... Uh, getting attuned to the spiritual and non-religious narratives of Saraswati, Gayatri, and Gargi. Simultaneous experiences to expel uh, superstition and inculcate rationalistic thoughts were also being introduced. For instance, responding to various myths and various other uh, stories, I can say. Pregnant silences, as we often say, is silence, not the womb for an artistic process. The early silent years of my life were perhaps only a gestation process of what lay ahead. It was in the same sense, or we could say some sense, one of the in initial Martandya phases which gave birth to artists in me. Who is, the, uh, who is my father in this process? Who put the brush and paint in my hands for the first time? He who birthed Seema out of Seema, is he the mother or the midwife? Is he the male biological father or the physical Seema or the feminine mother midwife of the artist Seema? Can we have the image of Saraswati on Garuda? Please. In this rare representation of Saraswati, 
the goddess of knowledge and arts is seen riding astride Vishnu's eagle Garuda, flying high above the rolling mountains. The other image is uh, of a bronze sculpture. Please can we see that also? That is done by me. And I would like to talk about the goddess Saraswati, who I have written like for I am the first born of essences. She was the first born out of essences. And birth again is a part of Surya. The propensity I feel towards the transformational energies of the feminine finds its due place in the painting. Vaishnavi writes Garuda. She is commonly represented as the goddess of power, wealth, and fertility. And here, surprisingly, Hiranyagar is also the fertile one, the one with the womb, the one through which all creation is taking place. Here, she sits on the royal bird, juggles and plays with the stars, planets, constellations, and the process she creates the universe. I have painted a sense of timelessness in the painting, and the time only moves with energy, the feminine force. The force is the propeller of karma in this universe. I'm more ancient than the effusions of the gods, for I'm the first born of essences. I am the artery of immortality, the drumming skies and the roaming daginis, the dragon splitting the skies with the pondering speed and behold, oozing fire, crackling the path of light, leading and lending a silver lining to the darkest cloud. Oh, you, the rider of the skies and the controller of the three roots, I watch you, oh sky conqueror, with awe gripping the soul beneath my feet. How gracefully, how gracefully you balance the stars which left the palm of your hand. I wait for the darkest night to watch you like an eager doe with the earnest eyes. And then we move on to time. Time, which we think is separate, but again, it is moving in a circular motion within the sun, within the Hiranyagal. I move in circular motion like time, as does life and death itself. Energy passing from one space to another. Oh, I'm sorry, I, can we have the other image again? Uh, I forgot. So is the idea of circumambulation across all faiths, a gesture profound to the feminine, signifying the never-ending loop of creation, the continuation of life rhythm. So you see here the birth uh, in this image. This is also a painting by me. In this image, uh, we can see uh, uh, the, the image next to, to this, after this. Can we have the other image? Yes, after this also. Uh, I'm sorry, I, we have moved from one image to another. So yeah, this image. So in this, you can see that how uh, the protector, the Shakti is holding the idea of birth, of creation, of universe through the whole of universe, it is happening, and the, it's moving in circular motion. It is just moving. So can we move to the other image, the Laya Pralaya? Uh, we would uh, leave the Bim Pratibim. That is where uh, the continuation of the form where Shiva sees himself in Shakti, which is called the continuation of life rhythm, and how to just through the reflection of seeing himself in Parvati, in Shakti, the creation is happening. The next is also called Laya Pradaya, which is also where the life is moving in the continuous motion. If you just see this painting, you will see how it is just not stopping. There is no, it's uh, like a whirlpool. 
And for this, I wrote a little poetry. Did I say I'm birth, then I'm also dead. This is Shakti saying that. Did I say I'm earth, then I'm also water. Did I say I'm laughter, then I'm also sorrow. Did I say I'm woman, then I'm also a man. Did I say I'm complete, but I'm just a fragment. Did I say I'm this world, but you know me as celestial. Did you not know that I am moral, but I can also be immoral. Main satya, asatya, sukh, dukh, bura, sach, jo bhi hai, usse pare ho. I am land and I am also the sky. Aap jis tarah se mujhe dekhe, however you may see me, I am that. And then I am sharing one other work which is called Ouroboros. It is an, uh, this is also uh, taken from the Greek uh, uh, mythology. Why I'm trying to integrate the other mythologies, other cultures within it. Because what I'm trying to say is that the Indian culture had also imbibed each and every culture within it. And so have I tried to explain and express different culture and the same concept of Hiranyagar through different voices, through different traditions, through different uh, expressions. So Ouroboros Aurobor, Aurobor, Aurobor expresses the unity of all things, material and spiritual, which never disappeared, but perpetually changing form in an, another eternal cycle of destruction and creation. This eternal cycle leads to an eventual liberation from mortality. The same idea is in our uh, uh, in Hindu mythology, which we talk of Chaurasi uh, Lakh Yogi. You know, we have different, and that every, we have to pass through different yonis, different births, and then we are come to the final stage of a human form, and maybe we can achieve final liberation. Ouroboros represents the wheel of time that helps to manifest grid programs that give the illusion of linear time, but the time is circular, allowing souls to, eter to experience other emotions, different forms of births, different forms of beings. It represents the cyclical nature of things, eternal return, and other things perceived as cycles that begin anew as soon as they end. And then there is another cycle, then there is another circle, then there is another way, just like a snake, which eats its own skin to rejuvenate, re-represent itself as a new form. Here I saw the snake as, um, as the form of soul, which is constantly recreating itself, re rejuvenating and moving on to another form. If you can uh, show uh, this uh, photo, uh, photograph, yeah, you have, sorry, sorry, uh, yeah. So this is a, a very small drawing that I wanted to uh, show that how it is eating and uh, its own skin and rejuvenating as new beings. And I did a performance of this uh, in 2011 uh, in which I tried to recreate myself, you know, uh, with the help of uh, a makeup artist, but it was so difficult, so difficult to uh, see myself transform constantly as a different being and emerge as somebody else I, uh, if you uh, can show the photograph of, uh, uh, if we can go back two images back. Uh, in, yeah, yeah. So here uh, I tried to represent myself as Jurasi Lakyo. These were 84 paintings, uh, 84 forms that I tried to take of different beings, gods, goddesses, and uh, animals and insects. But it was very difficult, I must say, that in that you realize what a small part of that continuous cycle of 
births and rebirths is there that you know you can't give yourself importance to be oh i am seema kohli and i am this no you just a, a small ek chhota sa katra hai aap bas usi tarah se you know in that small chain in that big chain you become a small bead which may be negligible you know so this was very transformative kind of work and you realize how this energy that we call hiranyagar i'm again going back to hiranyagar in this that how it just makes you it's almost magical it's like uh, you know you just don't alchemy jisko kehte hain it just changes you this whole concept of surya and this whole con concept of hiranyagarbha and martand ek swas jisse andar jata hai to that is brit when it goes in it becomes dead and when it comes out it is you are alive it is this constant magic that you are seeing we can go back to the images now uh, you know it will be yeah so again we are coming back to the idea of golden boom and in which uh, you know i try to show this painting uh, where there is a huge boom and through which there, there is a constant procreation which is happening which uh, is throbbing with life uh, for me this hiranyagarbha is the first eternal boom it bears all suns moons and universes from which the five elements earth water fire air and other emerge according to the hindu mythology the universal self is the uh, is the ultimate being jisko hum brahma kahe par brahma kahe that ultimate being that universal self of all bodies are an uh, outer garb which is neither male nor female nor good nor bad nor gold or silver the moment it takes a form it is maya or illusion or the feminine aspect of that universal self i would just like to recite another mantra through uh, uh, a sikh uh, uh, through the sikh verses which were uh, from which are from anand sahib i try to integrate everything within this jaise agni udhar mein taisi bahar maya maya agni sab eko jaisi karte khel rachaya ta tis bhana ta jamya parivar bhalla bhaya liv chhudki lagi trisna maya amar vartaya that the moment it takes the form and it, it disintegrates from the universe universal self it becomes maya and maya is constantly changing it's constantly creating illusions it's constantly reinventing itself i also believe that the same agni or urja or that energy which is inside the womb is pervading everything i feel that and every energy or agni are one and all universes are the sum product of that amalgamation of agni of that urja with the universal self you come from one single womb share the same single space how can how can you despair that i ride the mind holding its reins by its hair i am in celebration maya is in constant celebration of inventing and reinventing itself within that universal self by integrating and disintegrating itself a khel macha hua hai you know it's just like a is huge celebration which is happening within the brahma the para brahma and maya which if we realize and we understand oh my god what is this happening with this one single womb with this within this one universal space space it is beautiful so if you can see uh, this other painting we can move to the other painting uh, the blue one uh, yeah uh, oh we have a right there okay uh, yeah so this is a uh, 
if you can see the this is a tree of life if you can just see uh, the tree of life coming out and below its subliminal spaces are the essences through which the creation is taking place through which you can see maya doing its work within the tamas and then emerging out of those essences it uh, 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 is this image clear enough yeah uh, so i'm talking about how the birth is taking place within this lower subliminal uh, spaces just like it takes in a tree in the 15th verse uh, of bhagavad gita lord krishna has talked about the same thing urdha mula madha shakha mashvatam prahu rabyam chhandansi yasya paranani yastam ved savedavit i have talked about the same mantra in this that how each and every element is getting sort of cooked so it's being created and we are the bodies are being created and thrown out, out just like fruits of the trees and they are what we all are the cycle of life is such and i i'm really fascinated by this mantra i was taught this mantra when i was very young by my guru my father's guru and i have been captivated and now this mantra is also become a part of the golden womb and i see it all becoming together it's sort of everything is just getting together and it is forming its own life its own cycle its own cycle of creation in uh, you know it's also i would like to uh, share with you that bhagavad gita also speaks of an eternal ashvat tree with its roots above and trunks uh, and the branches below or ulta vriksha where human form becomes an ulta vriksha its leaves are intuitive knowledge and one who knows the secret of this tree is the knower of knowledge of transcendence the tree of life for me is very important element of nature and it presents itself in all my work it is important as an embryoic form as it is representational of steadfastness rootedness probably the only element of nature which expresses the connection of all the three worlds or the trinity in hindu mythology the world beneath us where the actual creation takes place tamas brahma the world where we are all living is vishnu or the sustainer or the growth or rajas and also the heavens or the unknown mahesha the sattva the seat of salvation or truth the flying figures i think that you see around in my all my works elevate one to the world of higher consciousness which we all are ultimately seeking or without knowing being led to seeking we sometimes i hear people no i i'm not a seeker i'm not on any path i do not believe in anything but knowingly or unknowingly we are all because we are all a part of that universal truth of that universal space we all are walking towards it whether we know it we believe it or we do not believe it for me the tree conveys the message of saving the environment and a symbol of unity given to human humanity crossing all religions and faiths the journey of banyanthi is circular expressing the continuation of cyclic nature of existence just as the hiranyaka or martanda we can move on uh, to the other uh, image uh, i just want to know uh, whether we have enough time or uh, i have to stop because i can go on about this subject and it is a subject which is moving in circular motion so if you could let me know uh, how much time we have aap apna aap complete kijiye aapne jo aaj ke topic mein then i am very happy 
then I'm really happy. Uh, I will continue. So this is one of my sculptures that I did uh, of golden womb. It is in bronze and it is so representational of what I'm talking about. That they, these are the, if you will uh, see the lower half is the, the, the ocean, the waters through which the tamas, through which uh, the images are, the creation is happening. And you also see the tree above it and the roots, the roots falling and capturing these uh, uh, sort of captivating the whole universe that is the universal truth. And above it is the, they are the intuitive, the knowledge, the tree uh, expressing, I, I'm expressing the intuitive knowledge through the leaves of, and the branches of the tree. The whole universe, which is there, it is encapsulated within this universe. So I will move now to uh, another aspect of creation, uh, which is uh, very important to me of motherhood, of uh, uh, the idea of constant creation. Uh, I would uh, like to just move to Hariti. Hariti, who has been, uh, she's the first goddess uh, of procreation from the Yakshi cult of the ancient Indic uh, Yaksha cult, uh, is said to have later converted to Buddhism and become a protectress of uh, children. Uh, but at present time, she is uh, called Santoshi uh, Mata or the protector of child. And that is the reason I talk about her because birthing, uh, she becomes the goddess of birth and again becomes directly connected to sun, the yakshas and the yakshis. How uh, actually this becomes a very vast subject and I don't know if I should enter there because it uh, sort of becomes uh, more profound and it becomes so, uh, I will move further. Uh, to uh, another aspect. I've been facing, fascinated by many other powerful mythological feminine representations. Uh, and I will move to uh, the idea of, you know, uh, how different cultures have incorporated this idea of golden womb or the idea of Hiranyagar the idea of uh, Martand. In that way, I'm also aware and inspired by other figures in the subcontinents who fervently spoke of the birth of women and closer to home uh, in Sikhism. Baba Nanak has also talked about uh, women and he talked about uh, the whole idea of uh, the, uh, the the purity of women, because at some point, the because of so many other, uh, I think, cultures and everything coming in, uh, the women were uh, treated not equal to uh, men, but initially they were. So to be in regular, uh, you know, uh, just talking about that, the men, uh, I'm talking about this whole idea of, the, uh, can we move to the images below uh, the moon cycle and its cycle? Uh, they are uh, on the blue because otherwise it will become too profound and too big, I think. Yeah, so we are uh, here. The, we can move uh, further. Yeah, so here we see the uh, moon cycle or the, uh, be it regular days or be it uh, days when women was in her menstrual period, periods, prayers and visiting uh, temples and gurdwaras was made open to all in that era. He recited this Shabbat to convey the message of women because he, uh, I'm talking about Baba Nana, where he said that from woman, a man is born. Within woman, a man is conceived. To be a woman, he is engaged and to marry to her. Woman becomes his friend. 
through woman, the future generations come. When his woman dies, he seeks another woman. To woman he's bound. So why call her bad? For from her, kings are born. From women, woman is born. Without woman, there would be no one at all. O Nanak, only the true Lord is without a woman, not because of woman. So he talked about, again, about the golden womb, about the space which was self-created and otherwise the rest is all Maya. And he also, in, in, uh, I think, uh, very indirectly uh, talked about the upliftment of women. Can we come down to the Swam Siddha images? Uh, so, yeah, we can move down also. So uh, I will talk about uh, what I consider a blessed connection of the divine guidance, lesson learned from life, hardships, and persistently insatiable creative thirst is my life. However, I have turned around this image every day I witness the oneness with the ultimate feminine power within me, through me and around me. The divine feminine that I paint on my canvas, I feel them emerging from my creative feminine self. The magnificence of the realization came to me soon enough and then appeared in my paintings. And I called myself the womb. I'm everywhere I am. I call myself a part of that Hiranyagar. I am that space. I am that space through which uh, a lot of, see, because when we are talking about the golden womb, we are talking about Hiranyagar, we are not only talking about that, uh, uh, of that uh, one biological space. We are talking about psychological, physiological, spiritual and all other spaces that we have, we can think about. My paintings are an attempt to manifest in strokes of color, the magnificent wonder that I experience in witnessing the creation of universe. The fragment carries the whole, just as the whole holds the fragment. Through my fragmented being as a human, I reach out to the wondrous whole of my being through my paintings. When I sprawl over my canvas with a brush in my hand, my small being as an artist is no longer small. My canvas becomes a womb of my own making. In that making, I'm no longer separate from the supreme reality and my limited self becomes one with the limitless. My larger than life canvases are a way for me to reach out to the spotting vastness of the entire existence. On my canvas comes alive a thousand iterations of cycles of death, of birth, and ideas. I revel in being a participant as well as a witness of his glory. I revel in becoming a vessel of death. Birth, the Martanda and Hiranyaga of these depictions. So I would like to mostly end it here with my, uh, if you can just come to my painting, so, uh, my photograph of we are doing a ritual at one of the Chausat Yogini temples uh, where I just saw uh, a round. Uh, it was a stone, a piece of stone, which was right at the center of the Chausat Yogini temple in uh, Dudhai. I don't know uh, if you're familiar with the Chausat Yogini cult, but that's a, again another area that I will have to enter. So this, uh, and I was so moved that I saw that and I thought, that this was also a part of the golden womb. This is what the womb is, which is actually so static, which is which we think is Martanda, but it is that space of all energy, all life, everything coming out of it, 
in a, a very, very beautiful way. So I picked up some leaves, some shrubs from around there, and I just poured some water on it. Just, I would do it on a shivalinga. And this was my obeisance to the golden home, the idea of that space of Hiranyagar. So I would like to end it here because otherwise I would have to <laughs> go on and on and on. Thank you so much for giving wow. me this space this time. Uh, uh, you know, Akhilesh Ji, it has been really beautiful. I hope uh, I've been of some re relevance because I was moving from one image to another. And I hope it has been, uh, you know, it has reached to the viewers in a way which is useful to them. So, Simaji, we are so touched by your presentation. It was like so uh, full of ideas, philosophy, art, painting, and poetry. Uh, I, and frankly, I had not expected this kind of rich uh, content. Uh, I was aware of your paintings, but I was not aware of your so many multiple facets of talent. Uh, oh, and, yeah, and based on that, I have one suggestion that uh, like you are a, a painter as well as sculptor and a poet. But I think it'd be a great theme to build on. Uh, I'd be very happy to host another program where we have poetry by painters. That would be wonderful. I uh, like if you can identify someone like like people like you, yes, yes, of who, course, who, who are moving uh, harmoniously on both sides, uh, painting and poetry. Yes, yes, of this, course. And this will this will resonate quite well with the Irish friends because in Ireland I see this trend that uh, most of the uh, popular and renowned poets they have inspired paintings. Uh, like W.B. Yeats, I went to Sligo and W.B. Yeats, who, uh, so he, based on his poems, I see many paintings have been created. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so similarly, so I, I want to take it the other way uh, because I'm interested in poetry, listening to po your poetry. So like, sure, if, sure. We can, if we can have, if you can collect maybe five, six friends like you who, who yes, are yeah. painters, uh, artists, as well as Poets. So that will be a very new area to explore. That would be wonderful. And, yeah, so you, you, you can present one painting and then talk about the poetry behind it, philosophy behind it. Uh, so this, will be, this will be very enriching. This is a great idea, and I'm uh, so glad that so spontaneously you have offered another kind of a way of reaching out and uh, taking this further. You know, yeah. this would be very wonderful. I will keep that in mind and yeah. keep it. also also you like you kept coming to one theme of continuity of life, circularity yeah. of life, and also how Indian wisdom uh, harmonizes contradictions. Absolutely, it, it, it like it shows you an underlying unity between beneath all the change. Absolutely, it unifies the contradictions. Absolutely. So this has very, very profound implication for our social thought. Like today, when we are like suffering because of our narrow-minded approach that either you are with me or you are against me, and then yes. binary, we are dealing used to dealing in binaries, black and white. Uh, whereas Indian philosophy harmonizes contradictions. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, ano raniyan mahato mahiyan. Uh, this, this, uh, yeah, it uh, is like a Mahiyan. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Tad dure tad uh, uh, yeah, and also like your idea of uh, uh, life and death in a circular motion, uh, yeah. dissolving and then recreating. So there is very beautiful Upanishadic shloka Yatha Nadya Syandya Mana. Samudre astam gachanti nama rupe vihai. Streams of water, they flow into a big, huge ocean, ocean. Finite ocean, and in that process, they lose their name and form. Absolutely. And then by losing, dissolving themselves, their identity, small pity identity, become they big. become infinite. Yes. So the, the life and death is a 
like this the so seamless which yes, you yes. really beautifully yes. narrated so this has like a lot of relevance for our contemporary society absolutely in absolutely. in harmonizing people from diverse contradictory views yeah yeah absolutely uh, and you you have given us a lot of real food for thought i uh, hope i was very fast in my <laughs> speaking <laughs> amazing it was incredible very very beautiful and your narration you also so your we were privileged to see your some of your work as well thank you so much akhilesh yeah. it's been a great uh, it's been very very nice to be here thank you so much and we look forward to keeping in touch and uh, working together again sure sure thank you thank, thank you so much thanks you.